Hi, hello, how are you? So, tonight we're nearly there. We're at the penultimate chapter of Ronya the Robber's Daughter, written by Astrid Lindgren. <gasps> tonight we find out just what's happened. So, we left it. Ronya was back home, wasn't she? In Mattis Keep. And then, well, Burke went home to um, but the Burkesons. I can't remember his name. Berkerson. Bor Borka. Borka. Borka's keep, didn't he? Um, but, but did he? That was my question. Did he actually, or did he go trotting back to the bear cave and shiver? I don't know. But tonight, I reckon, since it's the penultimate chapter, we'll find out. Are you ready? A little bit lengthier tonight. So I hope you're holding on tight. Here we go. The woods that Ronya loved, the autumn woods and the winter woods, they were her friends again now. In the last weeks in the bear's cave, she had felt them to be threatening and hostile, but now she went riding with Burke in a frosty forest that gave her nothing but joy, and she told Burke all about it. There you go. Solved in the first paragraph. Don't need to read any more. <laughs> as long as you know that you're going to be warm right down to your toes when you come home, you can be in the woods in all weathers but not if you have to lie shivering in a cold cave afterwards. And Burke, who had planned to spend the winter in the bear's cave, was now very glad to keep to warm himself by the fire at home in Borker's Keep. Yeah, solved. That was where he must live, he knew, and Ronya knew it too. Otherwise, there would be still more enmity in the fort on Mattis Mountain. And, you know, they were so extraordinarily glad, Undis and Borker, when I came home, said Burke, I would never have believed they cared so much about me. Yeah, you must live with them, said Ronya, until spring. It was welcome news to Mattis, too, that Burke was to stay at home. Of course, of course, he told Lovis. That little thief hound can come here and go here as he likes. I invited him to come home with us, after all, but it's a relief not to have to see that red head of his all the time. Life in Mattis Fort went on, and now it was jolly there again. The robbers sang and danced, and Mattis laughed his bellowing laugh as before. And yet the robber life was not exactly as it had been. The fight against the sheriff's men had grown tougher, and Mattis knew they were really after him now, and he explained why to Ronya. Just because we took Pele out of that miserable dungeon one dark night, and two of Borka's thieving dogs at the same time, Little Snip thought Pell was gonna be Pele was gonna be hanged," said Ronya. "No one hangs my robbers," said Mattis. "And now I've taught them that rascally Pele that robbers don't stay where you put them." But Noddle Pete shook his bald head thoughtfully. "And that was why we've got the soldiers swarming round the woods like cattle flies, and the sheriff will win in the end, Mattis." How many times do I have to tell you? There he went again. Old Noddle Pete nagging about Mattis and Borker being reconciled before it was too late. A single strong band of robbers might be able to handle the sheriff and all his merry men, but never two separate bands who wasted most of their time cheating each other and fighting over the plunder like wolves over morsels of flesh, said Noddle Pete. This was not the kind of thing Mattis liked to hear. It was quite enough for him to worry about it from time to time. You speak what you think, old man, said Mattis. Of course, you're right in a way. But who do you think would be the chief of that robber band? He gave a jeering laugh. Borker, eh? I, Mattis, I am the strongest and mightiest robber chieftain in all the mountains and forests, and I intend to remain so. But we can't be sure that Borka will understand that. Well, why don't you show him then, said Noddle Pete. You ought to be able to win in single combat with him, you great ox. This was what Noddle Pete had thought out in lonely hours of scheming. A single combat that would put Borka in his place and make him reasonable. Then they would have a single robber band in Mattis Fort with everyone helping to lure the soldiers onto the wrong track and lead them a dog's life until they got tired of hunting robbers. Wasn't that a cunning idea? 
I think the most cunning idea of all would be to stop robbing, said Ronya. I've always thought so. Noddle Pete smiled his friendly, toothless smile at her. You are quite right about that, Ronya. You are very bright, but I am too old and feeble to drum something like that into Matty's skull. Mattis looked at him in annoyance. And you can say that you, who were once a bold robber yourself, first under my father and then under me, stop robbing. But what would we live on then? Have you thought about that? Have you never noticed, asked Noddle Pete, that there are people who are not robbers and yet they all manage to live? Yeah, but how? Mattis said sourly. Well, there were several ways, Noddle P explained. I know something I could teach you if I didn't know that you are and will remain a robber until you are hanged. But all in good time, I'll tell Ronya a nice little secret. What sort of secret? Mattis asked. As I just said, said Noddle P, I'll tell Ronya so she won't be left helpless on the day that you are hanged. Hanged, hanged, be hanged, Mattis said angrily. Now be quiet, you miserable old croak. The days passed and Mattis did not listen to Noddle Pete's advice. But early one morning, before Mattis' robbers had got around to saddling their horses, Borka came riding up to the wolf's neck and asked to speak to Mattis. He came with bad news, and since his arch enemy had so generously rescued two of Borka's men from the sheriff's dungeon not long ago, he wanted to render a service in return and warn Mattis. Today no robber who valued his life should poke his nose into the woods, said Borka. Things had reached a pretty pass again. He had just come from the robber's walk where the soldiers had been lying in ambush. They had managed to capture two of his men and a third had been badly wounded by an arrow when he tried to escape. Oh, those brutes begrudge a poor robber he's leaving, Booker said bitterly. Mattis frowned. We'll have to teach them to mind their manners. We cannot have this sort of thing. It was only afterwards that he realised he'd said we and he sighed heavily. For a while he stood in silence, looking Borka up and down. Perhaps we should join forces, he said at last, although his own words made him shudder. Fancy talking like that to a Borka. How his father and grandfather and great-grandfather would toss and turn in their graves if they heard him. But Borka looked more cheerful. For once in your life you have something quite clever then, Mattis. One strong band of robbers. Hmm. That would be good, under one strong chief. I know one who would do, he said, drawing himself up. Strong and resourceful as I am. Then Mattis let out a terrible laugh. Come on, you, and I'll show you who would do as chief. <clears throat> so Noddle Pete got what he wanted. There would be a single combat. Mattis and Borka had finally decided it was a good idea. The excitement grew among their men as this remarkable news reached them, and on the morning of the fight, Mattis' robbers were making such a noise in the stone hall that Lovis had to drive them out. Get out, she shouted. I simply cannot listen to this row. It was li enough to listen to Mattis. He was striding up and down a stone hall, grinding his teeth and bragging about how he was going to batter Borker to bits until even Undis wouldn't recognise him. Noddle Pete snickered. Brag when you're riding home. That's what my mother always said. And Ronya stared with displeasure at her hot-headed father. I don't want to watch. Excuse me. I don't want to watch when you are doing the battering. Ah, uh, you won't be allowed to, Mattis said. Women and children were kept away. That was the custom. It was not thought to be good for them to see what happened at a wild beasts match, as trials of strength like this were called, and the violence that went on at them was reason enough for the name. But you're going to be there in any event, Noddle Peep, said Mattis. I know you've been feeling poorly, but a wild beasts match will put heart in you. Come on, old man, I'll put you on my horse. The time has come. 
It was a cold, sunny morning with frost on the ground and in the open space below the wolf's neck stood Mattis robbers and Borka's robbers with their spears forming a ring around Mattis and Borka. Now they were going to find out who would make the better chief. On top of a rocky outcrop crop close by sat Noddle Pete wrapped in a fur. He looked like a bedraggled old crow, but his eyes were shining with expectation and he was eagerly following what was happening below. The two champions had removed everything except their shirts and were now stamping around barefoot on the frosty ground. They fell and tensed their arm muscles and kicked out with their legs in all directions to limber up. You're looking a bit blue around your nose, Borka, said Mattis, but you'll be warm soon, I promise you. And I promise you the same, Borka assured him. In Wild Beasts matches, every kind of trick and dirty hold was allowed. You could break and bore, rip and tear, bite and scratch. You could kick with your bare feet too, but not between the legs. That was regarded as an outrage, and anyone who did it lost the fight forthwith. But now Fulox gave the sign they were waiting for. It was time to begin, and uttering war cries, Mattis and Borka rushed forward at each other. It is great sorrow for me, said Mattis, flinging his bear's arms around Borka's body, that you're such a dirty devil. Here he squeezed, but only enough to make Borka begin to sweat a bit. Otherwise I might have made you in my second in command long ago. He took a more ferocious grip. <clears throat> And not had to squeeze the kidneys out of you now. Here, he squashed Borka's ribs till he rattled. But when Borka had finished rattling, he drove his hard skull forcibly against Matty's nose so that the blood spurted. It is a great sorrow to me, said Borka, that I've got to smash your snout. He drove in another attack, because you were as ugly as anyone could wish already. Now he grabbed one of Mattis' ears and pulled. Two ears! Do you need more than one? He asked and pulled again. But as the ear was just beginning to come loose, Astrid, he lost his grip, for Mattis simultaneously sent him sprawling with an iron fist, pressed his face down until it felt much flatter than before. I am extraordinarily sorry to have to batter you until Undis will cry every time she sees you by daylight. He pressed again, but now Borka had succeeded in getting a little piece of Mattis' palm between his teeth, and he bit. Mattis gave a yell and tried to snatch his hand away, but Borka hung on until it had to stop for lack of breath. Then he smat. <laughs> then he spat a foot. <laughs> then he spat a few small scraps of skin in Mattis' face. Here you are. Take them home to the cat he said, but he was puffing and blowing because now Mattis was lying with his full weight on top of him and it was seen obvious that even if Borka had strong teeth, as far as the rest of his strength was concerned, he was no match for Mattis. Sounds more like a comedy sketch, apart from the bloodshed. Sounds more like a comedy wrestle, like when my dad and my uncle <laughs> used to wrestle <laughs> silly on a Sunday afternoon when I was little. They had a little in-depth analysis of the childhood of Mr. S. <laughs> when the fight was over, Mattis stood there, the chief now, bloodied face and with what was left of his shirt fluttering in rags around his body. Nevertheless, he was every inch a chieftain. All the robbers had to admit it, even though it was a mournful moment for some, especially Borka. Borka was much the worse for wear and close to tears, so Mattis thought he would give him a few words of comfort. Brother Borka, yes, from now on we're brothers, he said. You shall keep a chieftain's name and fame all your days of your life, and you can carry on with your own men. But don't forget, Mattis is the mightiest chieftain in all the mountains and woods, and my word counts for more than yours from now on. You know that. Borka nodded dumbly. He was not feeling particularly talkative at that very moment. But on the same evening, Mattis held a feast in the stone hall for the robbers of Mattis' fort, both his own and Borka's, a splendid banquet with plenty of food and a good deal of beer. And as the evening went on, Mattis and Borka became more and more like brothers. Now laughing, now crying, they sat side by side at the long table and remembered their childhood when they had hunted rats together in the old pigsty. 
Many other amusing things they had done together were now remembered and described. All the robbers, listening with relish, roared with laughter, and Burke and Ronya, sitting at the far end of the table, enjoyed hearing it too. Their laughter shrilled high and clear above the rough voices of the robbers, and it was a joy to Mattis and Borker to hear them. For a long hard time there had been no Ronya and no Burke to laugh in Mattis Fort, and Mattis and Borker had scarcely got accustomed to the joy of having them home again. So that laughter was like the sweetest music in their ears, and it encouraged them to relate even more of their childhood doings. But suddenly, Mattis said, Don't be upset, Borka, because things went badly for you today. Better times may come for the Borka clan, when you and I are no longer there, your son will be chief, I should think, because my daughter does not want to be, and when she says no, it is no. She gets that from her mother. Borka looked absolutely delighted to hear this, but Ronya called all the way up the table. So, you think Burke wants to be a robber chieftain? He does, said Borka positively. Then Burke strode across the floor and stopped where everyone could see him. He raised his right hand and swore a solemn oath that never would he become a robber, no matter what happened. A dismal silence fell over the stone hall. Borka sat there, tearfully bemoaning the son who had let them down so unnaturally, but Mattis tried to comfort him. I too have had to get used to it, he said, and you will have to get used to it too. You can't do anything with children these days. They do as they like. You just have to get used to it, but it's not easy. The two chieftains sat for a long time, gazing gloomily into a future in which their proud robber's life would be no more than a legend. Only gradually did they return to the memories of rat hunts and the pigsty and decide to enjoy themselves in spite of their headstrong children. And the robbers competed with one another in banishing all gloom with cheerful songs and vigorous dances. They whirled until the floorboards creaked. Burke and Ronya joined in with their dancing and Ronya taught Burke many a joyous robber's leap. Throughout all of this, Lovis and Undis sat in a room apart, eating, drinking and chatting. Their tastes and ideas were different in almost every way. There was only one thing they agreed on, how truly wonderful it was to be able to rest their ears from time to time and not have to hear so much as a single squeak from any menfolk. But in the stone hall the feast went on until Noddle Pete suddenly fell to the floor with exhaustion. He had had a glad and merry day despite his age, but now he could do no more, and Ronya helped him to his bedroom. There, tired and content, he sat down on his bed, and Ronya tucked the fur rug around him. Oh, it soothes my old heart, said Noddlepeat. That neither you nor Burke want to be a robber. It was something you could do with pleasure once upon a time, I won't deny it. But it's tough now, and you can be hanged before you even know it. Yeah, and people scream and sob when you take their things away from them, Ronya said. I'd never be able to stand that. No, my child, you'd never be able to stand that. But now, I'm going to tell you a nice little secret. If you promise never to tell it to a living soul, except one, Ronya promised. Then Noddle Pete took, out, took hold of her two warm little hands to warm his own, which were very cold. My little pride and joy, he said. When I was young and spent my time in the woods just like you, I happened one day to save the life of a little grey dwarf whom the harpies were determined to tear to pieces. Of course, grey dwarfs are riffraff, but this one was a little bit different and he was so grateful afterwards that I could scarcely get rid of him. He insisted on giving me... Oh, wait, here comes Mattis, said Noddle Pete, for Mattis was standing in a doorway now and wanted to know why Ronya had stayed away so long. The feast was over, and it was time for the wolf song. First I must hear the rest of this story. And as Mattis stood obstinately waiting, Noddle Pete whispered the rest in her ear. Good said Ronya when she heard it all. Night came and soon the whole of Mattis fort and all its rascally robbers were asleep, but Mattis was complaining bitterly as he lay in bed. Of course Lovis had smoothed ointment onto all his wounds and bruises, but it was no use. Now he had time to be aware of them and his injuries hurt him horribly if he so much as twitched his little toe. 
He was quite unable to sleep, and it annoyed him that Lovis lay there sleeping peacefully. At last he woke her up. I'm in terrible pain, he said, and my one hope is that that villain Borka is lying there hurting worse than me. Lovis turned towards the wall. Ugh, men, she said, and fell back asleep at once. <gasps> so there we go. Tomorrow, chapter 18. And it's only a little one as well. Oh my goodness. What was Noddle Pete's secret? Are we going to find that out in the last chapter? Don't leave us hanging with that one. Tell us about the the, the little dwarf. I want to know, Noddle Pete. I want to know, Noddle Pete. Tell us, tell us now, please. <laughs> I'm going to miss doing his voice. I will not miss doing Matt's voice. I, I don't know whether you noticed, but I occasionally have to pause and have a little drink. Because it really hurts my throat. Ow. <laughs> anyway. Thanks very much for listening. Good night. But if you're here for waffle, hey, how are you? Uh, so, whew, today, in comparison to that treacherously weathered day that we had yesterday, where it was just pouring, pouring, pouring with rain, rain, with rain all the time, with rain all the time, it's been absolutely glorious out there today, like proper glorious. I went and washed my car. <laughs> apart from i used the wrong sponge the man at the garage was like oh yeah we've put a special thing over it so you just have to use the jet wash and it'll be as good as new so i used the jet wash and then because it was so hunt sunny and hot the streaks just dried straight away so i got a cloth and was giving it a little bit of a wet wipe around there and then i realized that i got the wrong cloth it had some old uh, foam on it and some wax that I didn't get rid of last time when I washed my old car and it was slavery everywhere oh no so I've literally spent a good four hours out there <laughs> every time I walk out I see another streak mm. so I have to polish that up as well the neighbors were laughing at me hmm anyway uh yeah so there's that uh nothing else has happened today I think car wash has been the biggest thing i got up at half past three this morning whatever i don't know how you are when you sleep but i i fall asleep really easily lovely but the moment my brain starts to think again that's it i'm awake so i got up to go and use the toilet came back to bed and um yeah just started then thinking about just not you do you think nonsense in the middle of the night don't you and um yeah that was it i was awake so i just got up went downstairs made a cup of tea and sat there and watched john wick three <laughs> as you do at half past three in the morning so um yeah there was that uh one thing i was thinking about i i posted a message on reddit the other day and just said hey i'm a new youtuber uh any top tips and someone said like they looked at the channel and they said yeah you need to get a better camera i was like yeah, all right i'll just use my crummy old webcam on my laptop for now and they said get a better microphone like, what's wrong with using the kid's headset and then they said on instagram create more reels so i was laying there this morning thinking oh, i don't know how to do a reel so i've been trying to do that just before i came on here i literally recorded a reel about 20 times and i just sound like an idiot on there so um if you follow my instagram hopefully later on you'll see that i've uploaded a reel after about 40 attempts and um even if it's dire just consider this that's my best one <laughs> so um yeah if you go back to the start of this video as well, I started this video about 50 times as well recording it. I just couldn't speak my words this evening. And that's why I was giggling at the start of it, just because I was just laughing at myself. I did wonder whether I'd get tongue tied halfway through that one. But there we go. Anyway, enough about me. It's been bank holiday Monday here today in the UK or in England anyway. Uh, at that local gig thing tonight, we've got The Who playing. Do you know The Who? <laughs> Barbara O'Reilly, is that this? That's their song, in it? Pinball Wizard as well, you know, you know it. Uh, My Generation, 
all M ones. Yeah, they're playing just up the road tonight. Um, with Richard Ashcroft. Um, and I'm I'm pretty confident in saying that Richard Ashcroft was the guy from the band called The Verve, where um, uh, where he's walking down that street. You know, um, I can't remember the song now. It's it, it's done one of those things where it just slips out of my head. Uh. uh, 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 uh. <laughs> that one you know um and also the lightning seeds as well so there's they're quite big bands playing over there but there we go i'm not going to see him i'll hear it from the garden again as long as the wind is blowing in this direction we'll be all right won't we right there you go there's there's no other excitement stuff that i can tell you tonight i'm afraid which is probably why lots of it was a bit self-indulgent <sighs> Don't like that. Don't like that at all. All right. Okay. I'll see you soon. Have a good evening and I'll speak to you tomorrow. Bye.